Hey, Stacy David here, and this is the Tales of a Gearhead podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals since 1919. That's right, over 100 years building tools and still going strong. If you need tools, check them out. You won't be disappointed. All right, let's get rolling. You know, a while back, we did a feature story on the old Myers-Manx dune buggy, and the response was just phenomenal to it. If you didn't live through that era, and I say the era that would go from like the late 60s to like the 90s, was where those buggies were just, you know, everybody wanted them, but especially like into the 80s. Uh, The dune buggy was just the thing. I mean, they were that... Southern California sunny car, but they were everywhere, and they just just reeked of fun. So everybody wanted one. There were TV shows that had them in there. There were Disney movies. There were cartoons. And I just can't overemphasize how important the dune buggy was to the automotive world. The reason that I'm saying that is because my brother and I were, you know, kids in the late 70s, and we were looking for a dune buggy. Everybody wanted a dune buggy. So this is a story of something that happened to us one time. Now, my brother and I, you have to understand, we're only a year apart, but we're totally polar opposites. And what he likes in cars is usually completely different than me. Tony likes junkers and just kind of messing around and stuff. And I, you know, I want the hot rods and all the cool stuff. But we could agree on one thing. Dune buggies were cool. So he comes ripping in one day with a classified ad in front of him. And it says, Dune Buggy, $100. He goes, oh, man. He says, you win? You win? We're going to go look at it? And I'm like, yeah, let's, let's go. I don't even know if I could drive at the time. I'm not sure I had my driver's license. So this would have put me about 7th or 8th grade. Because out, out in Idaho, you could get your driver's license in ninth grade. So we grabbed Dad's little Datsun pickup. And we head out of town. Now, this thing is a good two hours away in the middle of nowhere. It's in Minkum, Idaho, which is, you know, and we were living in Pocatello at the time. So we're driving. I mean, it's hot and this and that. So we get off the interstate, and now we're driving up these paved roads, which then turn into gravel roads, which then turn into dirt roads. And now it's just like a like a glorified trail. And I'm, I'm looking at him. Now, we've been driving for an hour, hour and a half. And I'm like, are you, are you sure we're in the right place? He goes, no, I talked to the guy on the phone. And so we're looking. And now every once in a while, we'll see like this property and just like old cars and washers and dryers, you know, to the left and then to the right. And I'm like, man, we are in a rough area here. This is, <laughs> this is anywhere you're at in the country, this is what you would call hillbilly territory. So we're driving along, and pretty soon I look up, and there's this long line of equipment and cars and junk down this dirt driveway. I'm like, I bet that's where it is. And he's like, sure enough, that's it. So we turn in at the bottom of the driveway, and it's this long, steep driveway, and there at the bottom are some old, beat-up cars. And one of them at one time had been a Volkswagen Beetle, and somebody literally had taken a cutting torch and cut the body off of it, leaving just jagged edges of metal around and made little fenders, and it's just like this chassis with rusty metal edges around it. It's like somebody had opened the top of a Volkswagen Beetle with a can opener. It's exactly what it looked like. It was, it was garbage. And I said, there's your doom buggy, and I'm laughing. I'm kidding, right? <laughs> oh no. The guy trots down the hill with his sons and he's like, hey guys. He said, well, there's your dune buggy right there. And my brother was like, what? <laughs> and I'm laughing. Okay, I'm ready to get in the car and drive off. I, I wouldn't take this thing if he gave me 50 bucks. You know, this is pure garbage. So, you know, my brother's hem hawing around. He doesn't know what to say. It's awkward. You know, we've driven all the way out there and the guy's like, oh, there it is. And um, so my brother goes, well, does it run? And I'm like, seriously? You asked him if it could run? I mean, there's no brakes on it. There's there's no fuel tank. There's nothing. And sure enough, the guy goes, well, yeah, we'll get it running. 
So he, he tells his sons to go up the hill and grab a gas can and a battery. So here they come. They're lugging this stuff down the hill. And I'm looking at my brother like, seriously, I can't believe you asked him. You're not serious about this. And he goes, yeah, but I didn't know what to say. So anyway, these guys get to work on this thing. And, and now I'm starting to get interested because they're hooking the battery right, like right to the starter. And, they, you know, they're, they're spraying stuff on the throttle linkage to get everything to move because there's no fuel tank, there's no controls, there's nothing. So they get the battery, they get the ignition turned on, and then the father tells his one son to stand over the carburetor with the gas can and pour gas into it while he's arcing the starter down there. I kid you not. And this is going on, and the, and the motor starts to turn over. And I'm stepping back going, this is going to be a fireball. you know. And sure enough, and after a few minutes, they get this thing started. And the motor's sitting there running. Now, just visualize this in your head. The father's sitting there. There's no exhaust, so it's running right out of the heads, right into the face of the father who's kneeling down there beside it. And he's whacking the throttle open as the one son is pouring gas into the carburetor above him. Gas is sloshing all over him, you know, and the, the battery's still hooked up. And I'm like, he goes, what? have you heard it off? He says, what do you think? And he's revving that engine up. And I'm sure there was no oil in the motor or anything like that. And we're like, yeah, yeah, shut it off. Sounds great, you know. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, they're, they're all proud. Uh, then uh, my brother goes, well, you know, I'll have to think about it. And that kind of thing. And the guy's like, well, you know, first $100 takes it home. I'm not holding it for anybody. You know, we're like, yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you go ahead and sell it to somebody else. Man, we couldn't get in that car and get out of there fast enough. But... I have to say, in, as crazy as the situation was, man, it really gave me an appreciation that it was like, you know, with, uh, with enough ingenuity and creativity, you can get pretty much anything running. You know, I've remembered that through the years when I get into a situation and obviously I'm pulling something out of a barn or a field. As long as there's not mechanical damage, you can pretty much get it running. Now, obviously... You, you don't want to hook a hot battery to a starter that's arcing while you're pouring fuel in the carburetor. <laughs> that was quite an experience, man. And to this day, you know, I'll run into my brother. And we'll be like, hey, you want to go look at a dune buggy? <laughs> uh, he'll just roll his eyes and shut up, man, just shut up. You know, one question I get a lot uh, when guys are talking about jobs is about Cornwell Tools. We talk about Cornwell a lot, and you see me use their stuff on the show a lot. People are asking, hey, how do I become a dealer? Man, all you have to do is contact Cornwell, tell them you're interested in becoming a dealer, and uh, you'll be on your way. And it is a great company to work for, and they've been around a long time. You've seen the tools. You've seen the way they operate. They're definitely worth checking out. So if you're sitting there and kind of wondering where your life is going to go and maybe looking for a new career, you may want to look into becoming a Cornwell tool dealer. Okay, this next question comes from Jesse. Jesse says, hey, Stacy, longtime fan here. Thanks, Jesse. I appreciate that. He says, I'm watching your series on the boogie van. <laughs> That's so funny. They call it a boogie van. He's not the first one. You know, we never called it the boogie van. It's just, that's what they're called. That's just awesome, man. He says, anyway, you were talking about engine mounts for the LS. And he says, I have a 65 Ford Galaxy 500 XL convertible. And he said that I want to do something sacrilegious. I want to put a Chevy engine in it. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll need to talk about that. He says, how would I put an LS engine and a 6L ADE transmission into this Ford? Is there a company you can recommend that makes LS mounts for classic Fords? <laughs> Listen, that's, that, honestly, that's not uncommon. People like to put different engines in different things. You will get a ton of flack about that, but obviously you know that. You're a gearhead. Uh, if you're going to jump into something like that, you know that people are going to give you flack no matter what. So it's your car if that's what you want to do. Now, it is a 65 Galaxy convertible. So if it's all original, big block car, something like that, you may want to look at the originality before you cut it up too much. Uh, you, might, you might have something really valuable there that you may want to put your LS in something else. 
But if I can't talk you out of it, go into your question. And once, once again, this is a really good question because people are always uh, looking to put different engines in things. There is nobody that actually, that I know of, that specifically makes those mounts for that car for an LS. Now, there might be somebody. If you uh, just Google search it, you'll find out real quick. But obviously, you've probably done that, and you're not finding anything. However, there's a ton of companies out there, uh, from Holly to Advanced Adapters to just pretty much Speedway Motors. Anybody that has any kind of universal motor mounts for an LS you'll be able to drop it in there. Now, you're going to have to fabricate the mount. You're going to have to figure out where you're going to put it, you know, on your cross member or on your frame rails. You know, there's going to be some engineering on your part. Uh, you may want to ask around, but this is not, this is standard hot rod stuff here. Um, but your best bet is just to go to the street rod world. Uh, I know there's also places like Fat Man Fabrications. Anybody that specializes in street rods and just tell them, listen, I want to drop an LS into something. They'll be able to point you in the right direction. A lot of times these, like these motor mounts and transmission mounts, they come with a lot of extra metal on them to where you can trim them down and, and get them to fit exactly how you want them. Now, that's not saying that you might not have to make some different brackets or something, you know, for yourself, but it uh, sounds like you're able to do that. If you're even considering this, you obviously have to have some sort of fabrication skill. Now, go to the transmission here. I'm actually more concerned about the transmission than the motor. That Galaxy has got a massive engine bay, so you're not going to have trouble with that. That 6L80, that's a pretty big transmission. So um, you are probably looking at doing some modifications to the transmission tunnel to get that thing to fit up in there how you want. There's a lot of guys that get up in there with a hammer and bang it out a little bit. You know, if you need to move that transmission tunnel an eighth of an inch, maybe a quarter, that's fine. But if you need to move it an inch or something like that, no, you don't need to be in there with a hammer banging on stuff. You just need to cut it out, reshape the tunnel, and make a good, you know, floor that goes around that transmission. That way you can do your console, your shifter, everything that you want to do. Now, you haven't said how nicely you want to finish this out, but I assume if you're messing with the 65 Galaxy convertible, well, you probably want it to look pretty good. So once again, I steer you to the, the street rod world where you'll be able to find a lot of universal consoles, a lot of uh, shifters that would work for that, all the extra things that you're going to need from headers to, to motor mounts to um, transmission mounts everything and then just get something universal and adapt it as you need uh, good luck to you i'd like to see some pictures of it I'd like to see how you're doing make sure you do it nice that way the, the chevy guys and the ford guys can't hassle you too much if you do the work really well they'll look at it and go well at least you didn't turn it into a piece of junk <laughs> anyway looking forward to seeing that one good luck to you jesse All right, I've got a question here from Joey, and uh, Joey's from South Carolina. He says, hey, Stacy, I recently saw you feature a van upgrade on your show, uh, and you shared how Chevrolet vans are sometimes able to use parts from trucks. And he says, I have a 99 Chevy conversion van that I would like to switch to different bumpers. How can I find out what is interchangeable with similar model trucks or SUVs? Thanks for any uh, help that you can provide. Uh, love the show. I've been watching it for years. Well, Joey, thanks for watching, man. I appreciate that. And let's see if we can help you out on this van deal. Now, for those of you that are out there, it, this isn't just for a Chevy deal. The The Dodge and the Ford vans, they made them for a, a ton of time. And there's a lot of parts that do swap. The problem is there's not really a list out there. You just have to kind of either talk to somebody that knows or you have to kind of figure it out. Now, the suspension parts are pretty obvious. But when you're talking about bumpers here, just like we showed on the show, basically what you want to do is your best friend is a measuring tape on this. The thing you have to understand is you can make pretty much any bumper fit on any vehicle. It just depends on how much modification you want to do. <laughs> and obviously, most people want a direct bolt-on thing. Now, what you have to remember is when these vehicles changed their bumpers, a lot of times they didn't change the body panels but they did change the bumpers. And normally when they change the bumpers, that also means they change the bumper mounts. 
So almost 100% of the time, you have to get the bumper mount that goes with the particular bumper. And then where it mounts on the frame is probably going to be a little different too. So it means you're going to have to open up some holes and stuff. But that's one of the things that you have to be prepared for. One of the things that I found, uh, generally speaking, and be careful doing this, but generally speaking, the vans were a little narrower in the ballpark of two to four inches narrower in the bumper. So a lot of times a truck bumper will fit on there, but they will be a little wider. Now, sometimes that's nice. Uh, like we showed on the show, it'll go down the sides of the vehicle and you can kind of tuck it in. But other times, if you want the bumper narrower, you'll either have to narrow it or find one that'll, that fits the way you want. And a lot of times, listen, don't be just Chevrolet specific. A lot of times I will hunt through, for example, like an LMC catalog. And the reason I say LMC is the fact that they still have those diagrams in their catalog where you can actually see the shape of a bumper or a roll pan, and you can look at a bumper like maybe off of a 56 Chevy pickup. Rear bumper might have the right curvature and the right size that you're looking for. And then it's just up to you to uh, make the, the mounting brackets work. You know, look at Fords too. Anything, if you're out walking through a show and you see a cool bumper on a vehicle, Ford, Chevy, Dodge, Toyota, it doesn't matter. And you, li- and you like it and you see it, ask the guy, you know, you know, okay, what year is that vehicle? What bumper is on that? You know, they'll tell you what it is. Have your trusty tape measure there, measure it width. And chances are you can find something that way. Then it just becomes up to you to make it uh, fit on the, the actual mounting brackets. So there's a lot of things out there. I wish that I could tell you there was a place <laughs> that you could just dial up, you know, on the internet or something that would tell you exact fits. But they're just not out there. The good thing, once again, just to reiterate, Chevy, Ford, and Dodge, especially when it comes to vans and trucks, they didn't change a lot. You know, they changed the body panels. They'll change, you know, the grills and some things like that to make them look a little different. But frame rails, bumpers, bumper mounts, things like that, they didn't change a lot. So a lot of times it doesn't take much to modify them to make them fit, as we showed on the van project. Now, one thing to remember when you're talking about body modifications on a vehicle, whether especially trucks or vans, but even cars, even muscle cars, uh, one of the things that is the easiest to do and makes the biggest visual difference is your bumpers. Now, you know, we've talked about tucking bumpers. That's a big thing that, you know, nobody wants a big gap on their bumpers. You want them tucked up against the body on any nice custom vehicle. But... A lot of things you can do, you know, especially like on a truck or a van, instead of just bolting something on, if you've got some fabrication skills, just a few little tweaks on that bumper will make a world of difference. For example, uh, a lot of the bumpers are really tall. You can section the bumper, take a section of metal out of it and make it thinner, make it narrower uh, so it's not quite as tall. Or, you know, if it hangs out a little bit, you can cut it in the center and bring it together you know, keep the curve, keep the peak, and tuck it in from the sides. You can remove the bumper bolts, shave them as we call them, and make it a smooth bumper. And basically what you do is you take your carriage bolt and cut the head off of it, weld it in there with the washer on the backside. I showed how to do that on the show years ago. Probably it's time to show how to do that again. But there's a way to do that to completely smooth the bumper. And then you take it down, you know, you have it re-chromed or coppered or you, you paint it, whatever finish you're going to put on it. But just doing these little tweaks, you would be surprised what a difference it'll make to a vehicle where people will walk up and go, man, what is so smooth and cool about that? And you're just getting rid of a little bit of the ugly because keep in mind, especially on trucks and vans, (laughs) the manufacturers, they didn't care what they look like. They put big old honking bumpers on there because they knew people were going to be running them into garbage cans and stuff. So you can clean that up. It uh, doesn't take a lot of time, but uh, it does require a welder and a little bit of fabrication skill. But it's a great place to learn it as well because those bumpers, you know, they're thick metal. Uh, you can work on those. But keep in mind, even though they are thicker metal, you can warp a bumper and put a dimple in it. So you do need to pay attention to your heat and you do need to pay attention on, you know, trying to fill holes and spend too much time in one spot because you don't want to get a low spot in there. 
All right, that wraps it up for us today. Get out there and work on something. Spend some time turning some wrenches. And if you need some wrenches, make sure you check out Cornwell. They got all kinds of stuff to make your life easier in the shop. 